yeah, I definitely, uh, like you said, I, I definitely resonate with a man being the sum of his decisions because I think a lot of the, the decisions that we make kind of make up our integrity. You know, we um, the decisions that we make are a reflection of um, who we are and um, based on how we act is uh, really showing our true character. I think that the main principle is uh, you know, the benefit of consultation because people who need to make an important decision about something, they need to seek out someone who's had some uh, life's experiences so that uh, they can learn from that and uh, in the long run end up making more right decisions than wrong decisions. I think I've been blessed uh, in the, the times when I've had big decisions to make. One being, uh, you know, do I propose to my girlfriend? I, I actually uh, just recently became engaged um, this past month, so um, that was a huge decision for me. Um, I feel really blessed because I think there's been very integral men around me. Um, Eric, for instance, you know, just been there, and he's in the same walk of life, you know, where he's recently married. Um, but I have really close friends um, that that uh, I really, really look up to, uh, just um, and, and to hear their perspective and, and to understand that you know this decision that I'm making um, is not about me. Good morning, men. So uh, what I'd like to do first this morning is show you something new that's going on that can help you in your walk with Jesus as a disciple and in helping other men become disciples too. So we've just uh, updated the Man in the Mirror website. And so if you were to go on the Man in the Mirror, uh, you would see all of this. But, but but go ahead and just leave it at the top, Brian. And uh, the first thing you see is we help men disciple men, four ways you can take the next step, find out how. And so let's click on that, find out how, and that takes you, actually redirects you to uh, disciplemen.org, and where you will see these four entry points, if you will. So there are four ways that we could get more involved together, from the right to the left, and let me just overview them before you click. You know, uh, our vision is to, you know, to help every church disciple every man, and no matter where you are in your journey uh, on discipleship, we want to help. So these four things you can do, grow as a disciple, make disciples, build a ministry to the men in your church, or help uh, other churches disciple men. So let's just click on grow as a disciple. Let's just say that that would be the place where you wanted uh, to get more involved. You click on that button, and uh, it says, thanks for your desire to grow. You can become blah, blah, blah. And then all of these different uh, things that we can do uh, to help you immediately on the right, uh, get the discipleship blog, uh, use our daily devotional, uh, the view of this Bible study. Well, you're here, so you don't need that. Uh, something to honor your spouse, uh, the the 25th anniversary edition of The Man in the Mirror. We've got lots of different kinds of emails depending on where you are and, uh, and then the search capability. On the left-hand side, though, you can sign up for a series of emails uh, that will just uh, acquaint you with uh, some different things that would be very helpful for you to know to grow as a disciple. Let's go ahead and look at the second uh, button then. And uh, notice at the top right, uh, the, the, there's grow, make, build, help. So we'll just click on make. And uh, so the same think for if you want to make disciples, you know, how you can start a man in the mirror Bible study on the right hand side and a few other things. And also you can register for some emails. And then let's click on build. <clears throat> and so let's just say that you want to build a uh, ministry to the men in your church. Well, we can show you how to do that. So there's several things that you can get acquainted with right away on the right hand side, or you can sign up to get a series of emails uh, that would be very helpful on the left hand side. And then if you want to help other churches build ministries to men. You can click on that, and that's a redirect to areadirectors.org, where you can investigate a full or part-time paid or volunteer career at Man in the Mirror, and there's all the details. So uh, if you're interested, you know, check it out. Hope, hope you like it. So uh, what I do, uh, first of all, uh, 
Uh, welcome to our visitors this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time this morning, we're here every Friday except the Friday after Thanksgiving and after Christmas, and we'd love to have you any time that you are available. Uh, and, uh, but let's go ahead and do a couple shout-outs. Uh, the first one goes to Iron Men. Uh, thank you, Brian, by the way. Uh, Iron Men, the Trinity Lutheran Church and School in, uh, do I get this right, uh, Paso Roble? Paso Roble, California. See, I did Google Translate this morning. So, uh, These are 12 men. They've been meeting for three months on Sundays at 7.30 in the morning, doing uh, the Bible study with us. Uh, Stephen Will Weber, I hope I got that right, Stephen, is the uh, leader of that group, so welcome. And then also, uh, down in uh, Curacao, Cura, Curacao, <clears throat> uh, I looked that up on Google Translate also, I just can't remember what I heard. Uh, uh, but in uh, Willemstad, Curacao, and uh, uh, in the Netherlands, Antilles, uh, these are nine men. They've actually uh, been meeting for a long time, but they are, have been reconstituting. And for the last couple of months, they're meeting uh, on Thursday nights and Sunday mornings, alternating. Uh, and then Richard, uh, Maria, Maria, uh, I rolled the R, but you know, I don't even know what language you speak down there. I, you, there there's several different languages, so... Maybe I, maybe I got it wrong, so if I did, I'm sorry, Richard. Uh, anyway, we uh, are so honored and grateful to have both of you groups with us, and so I wonder if you men would join me in giving a warm man in the mirror welcome to these two groups. One, two, three, hoorah! Okay, welcome. Glad to have you guys with us. All right, so uh, the, the, the series is The Man in the Mirror. Uh, we're moving now into uh, a new section. The first message is entitled Decisions how to make the right choice. Um, and so, uh, over the course of a year, we only make two or three really major decisions, most of us, if that many. How many of you get the, the weekly reminder email about the Bible study? How, how many of you don't get it? Uh, so if, you, if you're interested in getting that, let's just, uh, Give me, give me your business card or something with your address on it, your email address, and we'll send that to you. But uh, we, we do send this out, and if you're online, you can you know, go to the Manage Subscriptions page and uh, sign up for that too, but you're probably already getting it, otherwise you wouldn't be watching today, I'm guessing, anyway. So, uh, but this is, a, this is where I really kind of introduce the, the topic of the day and try to create a little uh, gravity for it. And uh, that's what I said in the opening line. Most of us will only make a handful of truly major decisions in the course of, of a year. And these, these are the decisions like, you know, do I change jobs? Uh, do, I, do I take the job that wants to move me to another city? Uh, do, I, do we buy a new home? Do we have a, another child? Do we have a child? Do we adopt a child? Um, do I go ahead and declare bankruptcy and start over again? Do I hire this person or not hire this person? Do I let this person go or keep them even though they're, uh, they're disruptive uh, to a point where it's kind of borderline? Um, all kinds of major decisions. So, so what, what I'd like to do as we begin this morning is you no doubt have a, a, a major decision that, that you are facing right now. And so let's just let that be the shadow case for the lesson this morning. So as we go through this, uh, what we want to do is I want to show you a, a biblical process for making major decisions. One that will hopefully give you the wisdom that you need. You see, if your decision is a moral choice, you don't need my help. You don't need the help of the other men at your table. Uh, if it's a choice between right and wrong, you just, you already know what to do, all right? So the, the, well, I guess there is a choice, will I obey God or, 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 or not? But m the vast majority of these major decisions that we have to make, there is no prescription in the Bible for them. Do I marry this woman or that woman? <laughs> 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 
You're not going to get the Bible saying, I told you so. <laughs> and so what I want to do is I want to, I want to show you this process and lay it out for you, and you can operate on this big decision that you have sort of in the background. First up, though, we've got to cover this, the gravitas of this. Decision-making is a process that is barely understood. This is Bass and Stodgill's Handbook of Leadership. You see how thick that book is? You see all the post-it notes in there? Those are my post-it notes, and there's a note on each one of those, and because I've read this entire book. This is 7,500 summaries of articles and, uh, and, and on research and monographs, all academic research, on leadership and decision making. And the editor of this book comes to the conclusion that he could not find a single set of common traits or processes that, that describe how executives made their decisions. One Fortune 500 CEO re said, he put it in plain English, he said, I'll be darned if I have any idea how we make our major decisions around here. It's a process that is barely understood. Not only that, many major decisions turn out wrong. So Peter Drucker, in an article that he wrote for, uh, I forget, it's in the Man in the Mirror book, but I think it was the Harvard Business Review, some, somebody like it. Peter Drucker wrote an article, and, and he reported that uh, this guru, uh, guru of all management, all time, said that, that of, among the, the most effective people making hiring decisions, one-third, only one-third of those decisions turn out to be good decisions. One-third turned out to be mediocre at best, and one-third of them are outright failures. And in my PhD studies in organizational change, I discovered that two-thirds of all organizational change initiatives, whether it's uh, Six Sigma or some kind of quality improvement program or, or whatever it is, doesn't make any difference what kind of program, two-thirds of all organizational change initiatives fail outright. And that's without regard to whether they're public, private, profit, nonprofit. It's almost like an iron law. So, so, with this, with, there is this staggering amount of evidence that most of the major decisions you're going to make are going to be wrong. Some of you right now are thinking about your wife. <laughs> so, not only is it a process that is barely understood, and not only do many of these decisions turn out wrong, but finally, as I've already said, the Bible provides very, very little direct um, information about which way you should go on these major decisions. And so the, the goal in, in a moral choice is to do the right thing, but the goal in a priority choice where you have two right options, do I buy the red car or the, or, or the blue car, uh, the, the, the object of making those decisions is to be wise. And so how can you make the wise decision, all right? In this process of making the, these, this right choice, the, the overarching thing we're trying to do is we're trying to find what is the, the wise choice. What is the wise choice? Now, I said that this is a process that is barely understood but we can have a, a goal in mind for it. There is a set of principles that we can apply to it that are biblical. It's not hopeless. The Bible can lead you. Jesus can lead you to the right decision. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 26, verse, uh, from verse 36 on. So this is Jesus in the garden at Gethsemane, right after the the last meal they shared together, and uh, Jesus knows that he's about to be arrested, and so he takes Peter, James, and John, and he goes a little deeper into the garden, and then he leaves them, and he says, stay alert, and then he, he goes and he prays, and in verse 
39, it says, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Some of the major decisions that you are facing are, are not opportunities. They're excruciating problems. Uh, do, do I have, I have uh, two children that cannot and will not get along? How do I resolve that? So sometimes these problems are cups of suffering. And then Jesus goes on, yet, and so take it away from me, because that's what I want. Take away the suffering, that's what I want. My wife is wanting to leave me, uh, and I'm fighting for the marriage, and it just does, seems like I want to give up. I, I mean, I do want to give up. I, God, take this, take this away from me. That's what Jesus is saying. This is my, my, this is my cup. You know, Jesus said, you know, follow me, take up your cross, Deny yourself, follow me. What is that cross? Well, that's your burden. Whatever your burden is, take it up. Follow me. Deny yourself. But Jesus says here, yet not as I will, but as you will. God, this is what I want. But even more than what I want, I want what you want. This is the uber principle in decision making, in wise decision making, is to, it's to be able to say that, okay, God, you know, I, I, you, you have, my wife, we've been trying for, for, for eight years to have children. Eight years we've been trying to have children. Lord, we long to have children. Yet, yet, as much as we want to have children, Lord, even more than that, we want what you want. All right, so that's the uber principle here in decision making. And notice what happens. This is a big big deal because it says in verse 42, he went away a second time and he prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. My ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And then, and then it says in verse 44, so he left them and went away once more a third time and prayed the third time saying the same thing. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. Not my will, but your will. And that's the big idea today. The goal, the goal is always to bring my will into alignment with God's will. That's the big idea. The goal in making a wise decision, making the right decision, is always is to bring my will. Oh, man, and do I have a will? Now, I mean, some of you are wusses. You know, you don't have a will, okay? You're just kind of, you know, meandering along. I'm just joking with you. But, but some of us have Strong ideas and convictions about what's right and what we want to do and what we think, you know, how we want to leave the world a better place. What we want to accomplish, our desires, our ambitions. Guess what? Whatever your will is, you can be almost certain it is not God's will. You've heard me say this. The, The one sentence that I use to best describe my life, it is my theme sentence. Because God is good, my life has not turned out like I planned. And you, no doubt, can say exactly the same thing, exactly the same thing. Notice three times, three times he talks about bringing his will. Jesus says, Three times he talks about bringing his will into alignment with God's will. That should not go unnoticed. Jesus wanted something, but three times he he asked for his will, but he submitted that what he really wanted more even than that was God's will. All right, so how to not make the wrong decision is the next thing I'd like to talk about. 
Because, because decision-making is a process that is barely understood and many major decisions turn out wrong and the Bible doesn't give a lot of guidance on things that are, uh, and, uh, you know, on these, uh, it's called the adiaphora, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, things that are permissible, okay, that are not necessarily prohibited or commanded by scripture, everything else is lawful. And so it's those, those, that big group of decisions that we make, you know, do I take a job in Lakeland? You know, do I, whatever, you know, do I start my own business? Do I pour my life savings <laughs> into this new business venture? Do I make that investment? Uh, these are not things that are spelled out in scripture specifically. And so, the best insurance to not make the wrong, uh, to make the best insurance for making the right decision is to make sure that you understand how not to make the wrong decision. Are you with me? So, this is a risk management deal here, this section. How to not make the wrong decision. Well, there's a scripture for this as well. And it's found in Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Let's take a look at that. And as you're turning there, let us remember that this is an important lesson from Jesus. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that uh, we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we have been tempted and yet was without sin. So he understands what your major decision is, whether it's problem or opportunity. He understands. And he's given us this fantastic principle. Now let's take a look at how to not make the wrong decision. And once again, let's turn to the life of Jesus. So th this is the, the, the trifold temptation of Jesus. He's out in the wilderness. He's fasting. And uh, the, the, Satan comes to him. And uh, the first temptation is that he... Uh, tempts him to do what? To take some rocks and turn them into bread? Something like that, right? And so, so the first temptation here uh, is to, to go against the word of God. Jesus says, says, do not put the Lord your God to a test. So the first principle of not making the wrong decision is to, to make sure that you are in conformance with the, with the word of God. Um, and then secondly, the devil in verse five took him to the holy city and, and said, you know, throw yourself down and uh, the angels will come and rescue you and so forth. And Jesus says, it's also written, don't put the Lord your God to a test. So, if the, uh, the first way to make sure you make, don't make the wrong decision is, is uh, make sure you are in conformance with the, the word of God. How did I say that in the book? I didn't say it exactly like that. I said it better in the book. And, of course, you can never find anything when you're looking for it. But Yeah, our first step in making good decisions by not making wrong decisions is to live by the word of God. That's it. Live by the word of God. And then secondly, uh, the second principle is, is uh, you know, not, don't put God to a test. You know, don't put yourself in a position through your decisions that in order to rescue you, it's going to take a miracle. I've done that. We've all done that. But, I mean, the, we get our, we get our, our, our circumstances so uh, disrupted that... There's no way out. I mean, it is going to take a miracle. And that doesn't mean that he won't send the miracle. But if you want to not make the wrong decision, uh, don't put yourself in a, in a position that you're, you're testing God. And then the third uh, way is he, he tempts him to worship Satan. And that's the temptation we have is to, to worship and serve other gods. And and the principle there that Jesus gives in Matthew 4.10, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord God and serve him only. And so the third principle of effective decision-making um, 
and is, is to always worship God and serve him only in your decisions. So if you don't want to make the wrong decision, uh, the best insurance about it is live by the word of God. Uh, don't put God to the test and make sure that you are doing what you're doing in a way that worships God only, all right? So that's, that's how, to not, uh, how not to make the wrong decision. The big idea again here, the goal, the goal of all this, it's always to bring my will just as Jesus did, into conformity with the Father's will, with God's will. And then the uh, third piece of this that we'll look at this morning, how to make a wise decision, okay? So, so we've talked about the uber principle. We, we've talked about how difficult it is to make decisions. We've talked about how, you, uh, how Jesus, what Jesus' method to not, not make the, the wrong decision. And now, well, how do you actually make the wise decision? Ask your wife. <laughs> she, she already knows. She already knows the answer. So, and uh, if you're not married, get a wife, okay? And then, and then it's all taken care of. Or you could do the following. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you a cute story. I've told it here many, many years ago, because it happened many years ago. But I, uh, I, I had always wanted a radar detector. Now, I don't even know, I couldn't tell you why it was why I wanted a radar detector. I mean, I really don't drive in places where you could even use a radar detector. And I, I've only had just a handful of tickets in my whole life, because uh, I usually outrun the cops, so. Uh, <coughs> not, just, not that, but. But I just, I just, I just wanted one, and uh, totally irrational. And I get a magazine, a monthly magazine, and every month it has this radar detector ad on the back cover. Oh, maybe that's, maybe that's why I wanted one, because of the advertising impact. But anyway, <clears throat> with all of that convoluted reasoning, I don't know, I just, maybe I thought that it would be fun to be able to see the cop before he saw me, you know? Uh, something like that. Anyway, I bought one. And it came in the mail, and I opened it up, and my wife walks by, and, uh, and she says, what's that? And I tell her, explain, and she said, are you out of your stupid mind? You can't have one of those. You're in the ministry, for crying out loud. And I scratched my head. It took me about 15 minutes to figure it out. That, and so then I was glad it had a 30-day money-back guarantee. And so I packaged it up and, and sent it back. Uh, so, you know, it's not that easy to make a, a wise decision. All right, so I'm going to give you uh, seven means of guidance. Uh, uh, this, these are even broader than just decision-making. Uh, and uh, I'm going to draw your attention you don't need to even write these down. You can if you want, but they're also written out for you because on the table is a copy of an article called How to Make Major Decisions. And uh, we, I've, been, I've been writing these, uh, mostly me, some by David Delk and Brett Klemmer, but uh, for a dozen years, these articles, a monthly article on some men's issue and so uh, you can go to the, the, that website I showed you at the beginning, and in the search window, you can search for any, any conceivable men's topic or issue or leadership issue, and, and you'll, you'll find some hits. But this was the very first article I ever wrote for, for, the, uh, for this series, How to Make Major Decisions. <clears throat> and so I don't think I changed anything. On the inside, on page two, are these, these seven means of guidance, and the first one is the Bible. You know, this is the single most important question on any major de decision. Has God already spoken on this issue? Because if he has, then you already know what God's will is. If the big idea is to, uh, I I the goal is to bring my will into alignment with God's will, that means if, if God already has a will and he's written it down, then, then, then that settles the issue. Second uh, is, is prayer. So prayer is the currency of our personal relationship with Jesus. He, he just, he loves it when we love him. He loves it when we talk to him. He, he loves being in relationship with him. For Jesus 
Salvation is, among other things, it's, it's a relationship. He, it's a relationship. It's a reciprocal love relationship. And so lovers talk to each other. People who love each other talk to each other. You know, if I'm not talking to you, that means I don't like you. No, I'm just kidding about that. But, uh, you know, if, if, if we are in a relationship and we you know, communicate regularly and all of a sudden we're not talking, what do you, what do you sense? What do you feel? You miss the person, right? And so prayer is, is, a, is a fantastic way. And then the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, the, the Holy Spirit lives in each of us. There's several of his roles that are listed here. And, uh, but I love this verse, Romans 8, 27. The Spirit intercedes for us in accordance with what? God's will. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to bring our will into alignment with God's will. And so the Holy Spirit helps us do that as a means of guidance. Fourth, conscience. By the way, conscience is fantastic as a green light, uh, not so good, but as a red light, very good. Uh, because your conscience, uh, especially when you already want something really, really, really bad, you will, because of the flesh, we all have the flesh still, you can kid, trick, and fool yourself into believing something uh, uh, even against your conscience. Uh, if it's really bad, sometimes it's referred to as like a seared conscience. Some of you have probably heard that term before, maybe all of you. So use conscience as more of a, a red light. If you get a check, you know, in your, in your spirit, in your, uh, I don't know what other word to use except in your spirit. If you get a check in your spirit about doing something, Yesterday, I was at a meeting in Nashville, and, and uh, we were trying to decide whether or not to add a, uh, uh, a, an 11th principle to a list of, uh, of distinctives, and uh, a couple of us just had a check uh, in the wording, and because it, 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 looked, it looked really good, but there just was something that wasn't quite right, and then after a couple hours, it was pretty clear what was not right, but it was a good red light, that conscience, and then Number five, circumstances. Hey, look, if you're five foot six, uh, like to work with numbers and don't enjoy uh, being around people, you may not be an MBA star, but you might make a great accountant, you know? Uh, so if you have, uh, apply, if you need a $100,000 mortgage and you've applied for it for the, the house you really want, but you can only qualify for $75,000 mortgage, guess what? You know God's will. God speaks through circumstances. Money is a hand of providence. It's not the only hand of providence, but money is a hand of providence. God guides us with these financial things. And then <clears throat> counsel, it was mentioned in the opening video, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they uh, succeed. And so just to make sure that that you are able to have somebody that you can bounce these, these things off of. Hey, probably more than one, especially with somebody really close to you, um, uh, because they may have a, a vested interest in the outcome of the decision that you're about to make. So it's kind of a good idea to make sure you have some independent people around. Uh, getting counsel from a wife is actually a, an extremely good idea. And then the final one is, is the fasting. So, uh, brothers, that's what I wanted to say to you about making major decisions this morning. Your major decision, hopefully this will, this will help you. Um, I mean, we all make decisions every day all the time, right? Uh, one young 15-year-old man was telling me uh, in a storyboard session I was doing, he said, well, basically, we could just make everything about decisions, because really everything boils down to decisions. You know, we're the sum of the decisions that we make. The big idea today, the goal in making these decisions is always to bring my will into alignment with God's will. Father, thy will be done. Let's pray. Our dearest Father, thank you for your word. Just Jesus, thank you for laying out how you made your decisions and how you avoided making bad decisions and what your ultimate goal was in making your decisions. And, and Lord, I thank you uh, on behalf of these men also for giving the, us these means of guidance by which we can make uh, better uh, decisions and wise decisions. And I just pray for whatever those things are that are uh, troubling uh, uh, these men, my men, uh, your men, that you would uh, 
you would give them uh, something here today that would, that would encourage them and show them the way, the process by which they can make a decision that would honor and glorify you and be wise for them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.